The following podcast is an Embassy Row production. Welcome to another episode of the Shaken and Stirred Show. I'm Nigel Barker in New York, Woodstock to be precise. And I'm with my co-host who can't quite get the angle of his camera right. But hey, you know what? He's trying. Tom Astor in Deal, Kent, the UK. Okay. How are you, Tom? Hey, Nigel. I'm very well, thanks. How are you? I mean, well, I'm, on, well. I'm slightly I'm... getting nauseated by the way you're moving your camera around, um, but it's okay. Uh, this is the podcast, so everyone, you just have to listen to him. It doesn't really matter if you can't just, see. It gives me a black halo where I am at the moment. This piece no, of I know, but the whole of last episode, because you're in, Tom is on vacation, everyone. He's in, in, in uh, Deal in Kent, very beautiful area, mm. and he's been in this one room, and both times we've recorded, he has this black plate that's behind him on the wall that actually makes him look like he's wearing a beret. He looks like sort of Limal from, or a Nick Kershaw boy from, the, or Boy George even from the 1980s. He's very sort of 1980s boy band. That's just a horrible thing to say. It's not my least favorite period. But anyway, um, but how are you, Nigel? How's, how's upstate New York? How is, how's, um, fabulous. Like I actually saw a bear this morning. I woke up, went to make myself a cup of tea, looked out of the window, and there in my garden, actually in my tree house, was a bear, not a big one, not a giant bear. We have some real big 350 pound plus seven foot bears up here, but a sort of teenage looking bear, probably about, I don't know, 180 pounds, normal sort of human size, but um, in beautiful condition. And it, it's always a thrill to see a bear uh, in the morning. You know, uh, like I ran out after it, but I, I suddenly realized that I wasn't wearing much and, and I probably, you know, it was gonna terrify the neighbors. A thrill. I can't. Why would it be a thrill to see a bear in your garden? That's just, just like seeing a lion in your garden. It's not a thrill. It's probably. If I saw a lion in my garden, I realized something would have escaped from the zoo. But if it's a bear, you know, we share this landscape with bears up here in, in upstate New York, Catskills, and they are just the most. I love them. I just fascinated by them. Run out and see them. Uh, and, you know, they always run away. I mean, that's the thing. Then they don't ever really challenge you. What are you I'm, doing? You're running out of your house naked to try and walk, give him a hug or something, like a bear hug or something that comes know, from. Give him a bear hug, but I'm afraid he was slightly scared by my, by probably by my naked self, or just, even that it was just like, what's this naked mole rat coming at me and decided to run in the opposite way. Well, lucky it ran away. I am, I am. I'm not quite sure what I would have done had it come towards me when I was <laughs> naked. Could you imagine? Realize, realize the, 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 the error of your ways, too late. You know, you know. Tell me, what are you drinking, Omo? Listen, I'm drinking a um, a mummy's ginger special. Um, mummy's ginger special. Oh, because you're well, on you're on holiday with your mum, aren't you? I'm on holiday with my mother, and she, you know, I like trying out new cocktails, and I, you know, one can always just go around sort of um, looking up the old ones and the old books and getting them out and repeating them. But you can try new things. Now, my mother is drinking. This, she swears by it. She actually said that. Um, well, it, I tell you, the origins of this is she she gave this to a friend of hers who's in his seventies, who hasn't had a drink for about forty years, and he had it with a bit of tonic water, a bit of ice, and it's ginger, mochu ginger, right? Ginger juice. You see that, right? Yeah, I see that. And the friend of hers for forty years came around and said that was absolutely delicious, um, but it would have been better with the splash of vodka in it said that said the uh, reformed alcoholic so um i thought i'd take it one step further and put a splash of vodka in it and it's the most delicious ginger tonic water uh raw ginger tonic water and vodka wow um, not quite sure on the glass other than the fact that you're drinking like what looks like a pint of vodka and ginger shots which uh you know, ginger shot for a ginger man, mate. I, I'm well, not sure what that's going to do. That's mummy, double ginger right there. Mummy's ginger favourite. You are mummy's ginger favourite. I think you might be her only ginger. But anyway, right. I'm drinking. I went classic today because of our guest. I went for a little Vespa Martini. I'm taking it back, people. I use some Bar Hill honey infused gin from Bar Hill, which is delicious. Uh, and it's just one shot of that to two shots vodka. I went with the Grey Goose, the classic Grey Goose that I keep in the freezer. This glass was in the freezer and it's got a dash of Lillet Blanc. And then it is stirred, not shaken, 
despite what James Bond might have said. And then I have put a twist of lemon in it uh, and I rubbed it around the rim and it looks delicious. I've been waiting to sip it. I'm literally drooling. Cheers. Yes. Chin chin. Chin chin, my friend. Boom. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, it is. It's really fantastic. If you love a martini, I've got to say the Vespa for me is the way to go. It just has a tiniest bit of sweetness, but it's completely dry. And then has that citrus from the lemon and the Lillet Blanc. I mean, it's because a classic just dry martini with just straight vodka or something is just nothing for me. It's not even really a drink when they, you know, when people hardly do anything, just put vodka in a, in a glass. It's just alcohol. This, people, is a martini. There's a reason why it was James Bond's first. Booze news. Booze news. Not the nine o'clock news, which I love to say, but booze news. Um, I've got some funny news for you today. Uh, okay, so we, we know we've talked about the pandemic once or twice over the past year, clearly, because we're in a we've been in a pandemic. But as we all know, the alcohol industry has suffered, and we haven't talked too much about it recently about you know how it's coped and what's going been going on. But obviously, bars, restaurants have been suffering. There's no doubt about that. Now, you'd be surprised to know that. Obviously, as things have picked up, where would you think the busiest bars would be? The busiest bars in any state, anywhere. Well, Tom, take a guess. Where, where you name the, the busiest bar? Where, where would you think the busiest bar would be? I mean, are you talking about holiday destinations? I would say probably. Okay, so in a in, at a hotel somewhere on a holiday destination. Well, you're almost there. This is the interesting part. You're right, as far as like holiday destinations, they also suffered. And so therefore people who are now going on holiday, if they can, those bars would no doubt be very, very busy. But as you also noted, air, airports and, and sort of, you know, obviously airlines have suffered enormously. And they've also, many airlines have stopped serving drink on airplanes for some bizarre reason. I think people were just drinking too much when they got on them, or they just didn't have enough passengers during the pandemic, so they canceled drinks. So it turns out the bars at airports have become the busiest bars in the country. In fact, Houston, the, the, the Houston's busiest bar what was in fact at Hobby Airport and it did nearly a million dollars worth of business in the month of June alone. The next busiest bar outside of the airport did only $600,000. And this is Houston, the city of Houston in Texas, people. So you can just see what business is being done in these airports. Quite amazing, if you ask me. And uh, obviously people are trying to get a little tanked up before they get on that airplane, people. So maybe they better bring back the alcohol on the planes is all I can say. But is that, is that, yeah, but what is the alcohol ban on airplanes? Is that something that's, is that, is that across the board, all airlines? Is that, where is that? I mean, is that happening like just in America or is it happening on transatlantic flights? I mean. Yeah. Good question. I, I doubt. I don't know the answer to that. I know on on domestic flights that a lot of you know airlines, United, Delta, American, have um, either reduced you know dr drastically or you know not sort of giving them away perhaps. But you know, and, and a lot of air airlines are just not serving alcohol or food, have, and, and have been doing that in the pandemic. So you know, clearly as things have, are starting to change, that may change too. But it hasn't changed yet. Um, we have a wonderful guest. We have an extraordinary guest. The guest we've been trying to get on this show for some time I had to cancel on us once before because of something came up, but we've got him. We've finally got him. Our guest today is a well-renowned artist inspired by nature and 60 pet birds, best known for his series of bunnies, butterflies, and tropical birds, as well as his large-scale sculptures and restorations of forgotten historic homes. His works can be found in the permanent collections of 250 that's 250 museums around the world, including the Guggenheim Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, the Whitney. He has a new book coming out called The Bigger Picture. Please welcome Hunt Slenham. Hunt, how are you? I'm great. Thank you. Wonderful, I wonderful. Did... You just turned 70 as well. Do we have to start with that? <laughs> Happy birthday, yes, what I'm thanks. trying to get to here. I spent my Sunday, my actual birthday, July 18th, at my new purchase, which is called Searle's Castle in Great Barrington, New York. I just purchased a Stanford White 
castle that's 60,000 square feet on 80 acres in the middle of Great Barrington, which I've known about for a hundred years. And it was wonderful. And somebody came in and the music hall played happy birthday and it was great. Wow. There's a couple of us, but it was wonderful. Many other celebrations happened well, as well. We have some fun stories about upstate New York and rather fun big houses, Tom and I, because Tom's old family, Tom is sort of, Tom's last name is Astor. And you may well know of obviously the Astor family in New York and what have you. And so Tom's oh, family have a rather fabulous house that Tom and I broke into. Um, so it literally broke into, we went looking for it, didn't we, Tom? And we went, found this house and it, the door was open and we just went in. Which house was it? Do you know what? I'm completely, um, I was completely sidetracked when you just said that you would, you'd been at your house in a place called Great Barrington. Yeah. Um, it, so about 10 minutes away from where I live in the Cotswolds, there's a, there's a village called Great Barrington, which must... Oh, really? I can only assume is 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 uh it w w was where the name of your place comes from, yeah. And it's got a and a friend of mine lives there. Well, not a friend, and a guy I know lives there. Um, and it's one of those great. It's one of those fantastic old Cotswold villages that, where the whole the village is basically owned by the guy who he's he's got a big house on on, on it. It's basically a big estate that owns the whole, the local village, and it's called there's Great Barrington. There's a little Barrington. Um, and I'm completely side sidetracked by that because it must be someone at some point must have thought, why don't we call, you know, because there are so many towns and things in America that are named after English places, right? Most um, of them. Yeah, Most so, of them are. <laughs> but Great Barrington is this wonderful, really pretty little village in the Cotswolds. I mean, it's one of those little chocolate box villages that, you know, it's a, but it's of no sort of, it's of kind of no, um, you know, historical value other than the fact that it's got a big estate on it. So I guess the guy who used to live on the estate there must have, must have given, lent his name to where you are now. Well, it's, ours is a little village too, but it's near Lenox, Stockbridge, Tanglewood, Sharon, Connecticut. It's kind of a great area. Most of my other houses are not in great areas, but, um, this one was built by Stanford White for the railroad heiress, Mrs. Hopkins, whose home in San Francisco was one of my favorite houses ever built in America. And it was destroyed by the earthquake. And then she came back here and started this great house. And her husband died um, while it was being built. And she married her decorator from Herder Brothers, whose name was Thurl. Anyway, he inherited it. But originally the house was called Kellogg Terrace. Oh, no, no way. Anyway, it's huge. It has 50 rooms and it's great. Amazing. It's I mean, the, every episode of Shaken and Stirred, we start off, Hunt, by asking our guests what they're drinking. Now, you're not drinking anything particularly exciting, but you did have a rather big night last night. What are you drinking there? Pellegrino. There I'm an go. ex drinker. <laughs> That's That's okay. I have had enough alcohol in my life for, for several lifetimes, and I quit a number of years ago. Fair enough. So, well, cheers. Diet nonetheless. Coke and Pellegrino. <laughs> it's we famous like it. Italian pick me up, like the, like the Bloody Mary. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. Con congratulations on all your success. You've obviously are a well known, very, very renowned artist, and you, you've, you've done extraordinary work renovating houses. And you mentioned that you have several in your new house in Great Barrington and what have you. Now, you have a new book coming out, The Bigger Picture. Um, but before we get to all of that, I'd love to sort of also get back to a little bit about your youth and you know you I, having done some research on you you, know, you grew up in a military family where your, your father was a naval man i believe and and you traveled yeah. around the world with him I, to take take us back to that point and your inspirations and how you started to dabble because i think for a lot of people they always wonder how people get started how do you get to where you are right now what was that what, what, what were there any moments as a child that you were just had an epiphany type of thing very early on, I never wanted to. My father was a submariner, and he went to the Naval Academy. In fact, we were just at Annapolis over the weekend. No, Monday, Tuesday, my mother passed away, and we put her in the mausoleum with my father. And I hadn't been there. You know, John Paul Jones is buried there. And anyway, very historic and brought back a million memories. My father always also went to MIT, and I was born in Maine by chance because of that 
Um, the most exciting part of my upbringing was um, moving. Well, my mother's family was from Chattanooga originally, her mother, and my grandfather painted. So I was exposed to painting early on. I grew up around wet oil paintings that he would ship us. And he, anyway, I, we moved to Hawaii and I, that's kind of where my love of nature just exploded and I raised orchids and had lots of birds and just observed nature constantly. And everything I do today, I've been doing since I was very, very young. When I was in first grade, we had to draw a picture of what we wanted to do when we grew up. And I drew a picture of myself standing in an easel painting, which today would be considered a rather old fashioned idea. But back then I just never wanted to do anything else and had no idea how you went about it. But um, the way life works, I was brought back to Maine. I went to the Skowhegan School and moved to New York after that. And I've been here ever since 1973. And I've done everything from be part of the recreation of the WPA where Cultural Council Foundation Artists Project. I painted murals at the World Trade Center. I did saints for churches. I did huge murals in Harlem and Brooklyn for schools. It was a wonderful way of keeping rent paid and doing public art, which is one of my favorite things to do. It's been quite a bit since. Um, I was also an exchange student in Nicaragua in high school. Again, I'd play hooky and be dropped off in the jungles to watch butterflies and nature and it's just been nurtured and fed all the way along the road. And I never had any conflicts, unlike other members of my family who had multiple talents and had a harder time deciding. But I've been true blue to wanting to paint and make art ever since I was a child. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And, you know, obviously, bunnies, butterflies, and tropical birds, you mentioned them just now in, in, in your last, in what you just said. And, you know, you've, you've obviously immortalized them in many different ways in many different mediums um in many beautiful different colors in all over the world in extraordinary places um you have said that there is a spiritual message behind everything that you do so what is what, what do you mean by that first of all a spiritual message and and then for example with your pictures of birds what is the spiritual message behind that, for example, there's a picture right next to you right now. Well, the bird is a symbol of the human soul and almost every religion man has ever created. Um, so we'll start with that. There's a lot of Hindu legends about tigers running around in trees with a bird in a cage on its head. I've been to India a fair number of times. I had shows there in the 80s and I used to go to ashrams a lot. Um, Anyway, the bird is the soul and the cage is the human body and harnessing the senses is the way of mastering the whole thing according to the legend. And, you know, I meditate and do mantras all the time. So I actually, I make a lot of marks in my work and I kind of say a mantra as I do it. It's, it's not completely obvious that I'm not screaming a message. I started out by painting Hindu saints and Christian saints and had millions of shows and all the things that I painted, they come out of those much earlier paintings that I did in the seventies. Uh, I did a painting I called Seven Saints years ago, eighties. And um, it was off at a show for a long time and it came back and I got a call it was about eight in the morning from um, our restaurant corporation and Michael Weinstein said, do you still have that painting of Seven Saints? We just built new offices and measure it because I want to put it in the entrance of our building. And it was too long and he rebuilt the wall to accommodate. Wow. But I had just gotten it back like two days before. So there's always a synchronistic, mystical aspect to it, whether it's the figure or the representation through nature and just the embodiment of divinity in mark making a lot of my paintings have monkey eyes which are symbols you know i call them guardian painting kind of a reference to shiva who was the guardian uh sorry hanuman who was the guardian of lord shiva and you know 
his, it was about devotion and chief asked him to bring some plant he didn't know what it was so he brought him the whole mountain just you know that kind of thing so i put the monkey eyes behind the butterflies in many of the paintings the symbol of <clears throat> protection and devotion it goes on and on and on the butterfly is i don't mean to sound bored but the butterfly is obviously the symbol of <clears throat> transformation and um the rabbits speak to me through mystics and channelers and call it the great leap forward. Um, they all have voices, they all have messages, and just living with them can be a very uplifting experience. They get a tremendous amount of feedback from people. Like last night, we had a gathering. People flew in from eight states to come to our boat ride, <laughs> and they all had stories of how they formed relationships and you know people have become pregnant and they buy a painting and then they give it to the child even the kardashian kylie kardashian has a rabbit in front of her baby when it was born the mother anyway it goes on and on and on and on it, it may impact people's lives in that way it seems i'm not taking credit for it it's just what I'm, the feedback i get no, well, absolutely. And why not take some sort of, I mean, the credit is there regardless of whether you take it or not. I mean, it's, you know, there's, <laughs> you know, you're, you, I, you know, looking at that picture of yours behind you with the, with the, it looks like parrots, you know, and they're obviously that you're part of your bird series. Amazon. Yeah. Amazon. So, so you, you know, there's a lot of, when you get into there something, type of a parrot. Right. Well, when you get into something, you kind of really get into it, right? You sort of, and, and I mean, you talk about repetition. I, I never abandoned anything. Right. No, I was going to ask you about the repetition, about the, the sort of finding an idea, finding with like, okay, I'm getting into birds and then, um, or bunnies and then going, okay, I'm going to do bunnies on everything. I'm going to do, you know, birds on everything, butterflies everywhere. I'm going to, you know, create, and then you, you know, so that there's, you know, and I've seen series of your pictures and it's, it's just, it's a sort of a similar picture of a bunny or something and you, that one look and you'll do it over and over and over again. What is it about the repetition that for you is important? Is it in itself like a mantra? Yes, you get it, you hit it on the nose. The rep repetition of a divine thing. And, it, you know, it's been wonderful for me in that because I'm not struggling to find new... I've, my subject matter has been varied forever, but you're only seeing the things that have kind of caught on. Um, there's a there's books on my work that have hundreds of other themes in them. Um, and they were repeated as well. But um, I've been able to explore uh, different mediums and other forms with the subject matter. I'm now doing glass, I'm doing bronze, rabbits. I'm doing, you know, 22 foot tall butterfly sculptures for Butterfly Park. I'm doing. Um, Diamond dust. My one of my Bulgarian dealer, Ted Vasilev, who we were close to together. He gave the party last night. He's involved we in the Ted. book. Ted's been, Ted's been on the Shaken and Stirred show himself, so we know all about Ted. I bet. Well, he brought me diamond dust and said, "Giving this to you and Damien Hurst and Mark Quinn. Use it." And I had actually done diamond dust for Warhol with Rupert Smith. We did a shadow painting and you know that's why i did this in the 80s or something i happened to be there and they needed my help so i hadn't really i was familiar with it and his shoe painting was full of diamond dust. so with my assistance we found a way of adhering it to resin and color and then i paint into you know the imagery over the sandpaper like surface which is something completely new for me and it's been a huge success and it's really fun to live with because it glistens and light changes and i really personally get a kick out of having it around me in places that i live as well so how do you, and so then people, metal have a diamond dust, people have a diamond dust picture painting lots of them yes absolutely how many, how much diamond dust did Ted give you, for goodness sakes? Are you now in the business of getting Oh, I've heard truckloads since then. He stopped giving it. I had to find it myself. 
he got you addicted. I think Ted was Ted was in on something there. He probably was like, "Okay, I know, I know a dealer for for diamond dust. I'm going to give some to." I really hadn't. I had no idea how I was going to use it. When I first did it, I was gluing it onto prints that I was making um, on paper. But now it's on canvas and resin, and very seriously put together so that it can't fall. Or, but it is a little bit sharp. So take, 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 tell us about your process, because I think that's interesting. You produce a lot of art. You've got a lot of big things going on. I mean, do you have, I mean, and I mean this in all due respect, do you have a team of people who help you doing aspects of it? Or, I mean, you know, there's some of these big sculptures and things, you know, they, I mean, what is your process? Who, what, is the, what does it look like when you're doing these things? Well, each thing is different. I'm a painter. I, I get up and paint every day of my life that I'm in the studio or come up with ideas when I'm not. And I paint all day long with interruptions and other things. Um, the sculpture, I design it. I paint it sometimes. It depends on what it is, where it is. I've done 10 monumental sculptures in Louisiana where I have three homes from the 1850s and earlier, which I've restored and I'm restoring some of which I even studied in school. I went to college there. Um, at Tulane. That's where I graduated from. Started yeah. at Vanderbilt. Okay. So each piece is a different story. I mean, I, went, I was in a wheelchair for a while 15 years ago, and we painted them on my front porch of one of my houses called Albania. Um, they're all a challenge. They're all unique. So, um, bronze I design and then it's or you know I don't pour it or anything I have gotten involved with the glass making um blowing and what not um but my main thing is painting and everything else comes out of what I've come up with through the painting of a huge and I've been doing it for so long it's really kind of I'm blessed to have made it this far so many people haven't including my brother, who was a writer. Um, so I'm in this big studio in Brooklyn. I've been through something like eight or nine studios. I've been in New York. They keep tearing them down. Uh, Hudson Yards is the last big studio in Manhattan, and that went when they signed the deal. And I found this in Brooklyn. Um, not where I wanted to be, but it's a great space and it's about 30,000 square feet. And I have a conservatory. We grow orchids here. And we can see and, you know, hang the work. And it's afforded me more space than I had before this. Um, I used to travel a great deal for shows and process. I, you know, new series come out of every travel experience I've had, I can identify, you know, there's the monsoon season in India, Spain, a series of paintings are red, uh, Scandinavia was what I call the Pukul series, it's kind of a white series, then I crossed that. Do you get, you, a lot you get inspired then, by, you're, you're inspired by something you see or something that you love, but what makes it into the sort of pantheon of Hunt Sloanham classic, you know, like the bunny rabbits, the, the butterflies, the birds. How does it, how do you, how do you sort of figure out, okay, this is going to be a thing. This is going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to really get into the, is it something I don't that figure out anything. It's not premeditated. I don't have a plan. I just get up and do it. And um, I used to paint people all the time. <clears throat> that um, is not as much as I used to. The rabbits really caught on. I don't know. It was just a complete surprise. I was kind of inspired. I was at a dealer's house one day and I saw this little Hans um, Hoffman painting and they said this is what he called his warm up painting. And I somehow was inspired by that and I um, started doing a lot of 8x10 images, which often were rabbits in those days and continue to be. And I started out my day with series of these smaller works. And I finding the things, you know, shouldn't scouring the countryside for antique frames has been part of it. I had a show at Virginia Commonwealth University in 
Richmond years ago and they wanted me to frame the painting and I couldn't afford contemporary frames at that point. And I started going to the flea market and lo and behold, Victorian photographs were eight by 10. And there were millions of these frames made in those days. In fact, the New Orleans Museum did a whole show on them as Eli Wildner has turned the frame into an incredibly collectible and often more valuable than the painting thing. Um, I have frames here that are worth a hundred thousand dollars that I've traded for. So anyway, it just turns out that these specific sizes in my warm up turned into this bunny wall thing. I started hanging them to dry and we photographed them and it became a book cover and later many other things. Um, there's wallpapers that are being made of them now as well, which is kind of another fun thing. I loved seeing the show of uh, Birchfield at the Whitney. He was a wallpaper maker for 18 years of his life. And they hung his paintings on his early wallpaper. And I thought that was just terrific. You know, Warhol did a lot of what was considered wallpaper, the cow series and whatnot, and things were hung on it. So I've kind of integrated all those ideas. And what I do, I do a lot of installations and museums. We just did one in the Taubman called Huntropolis. And, you know, I read save 19th century furniture and upholster it with my fabric and save. I love saving things that, you know, I think the New Orleans influenced that. The Richard Sexton did a book called Vestiges of Grandeur. And I think that kind of sums up my fascination with these interiors. Absolutely. Anyway, well, I, mean, I mean, look, I mean, I, I, here's another quote by you. You said, you said, my whole life could be summed up by the word exotica. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and color is vibration. It's good for clearing spiritual disharmony. When you say your, your whole life could be summed up by the word exotica, what do you mean? Well, you know, the word exotica literally means the unknown. I think of it as, you know, ginger flowers and tikaki and, you know, tropical things that I've never heard of. My first two can had in Nicaragua in 1968, but it could be a computer too. Um, so I just like that term. There was a show early on that Barry Swabsky did in New York. It was called Exotica. And um, I was painting Inca gold at that time. I just returned from Peru. And I was fascinated by the Atahualpa legend where he said, I'll fill a room up to as far as he could reach if he'll free me. And then did it, and then they killed him anyway. But I love that idea of filling the room with gold. And I <clears throat> did it many times with the painting. Um, it's just all of these things are part of nature, part of overlooked exquisiteness that people don't know about. I love the um, quote about the bulldozer driver in the Amazon that's knocking down an acre of land and he's the only person that will ever see some of the life forms that he's destroying forever. So for me, it means taking a better look at nature the experiences I've had of seeing the first morpho butterfly I ever saw in a coffee plantation in Nicaragua was just an, such a phenomenal experience. Um, you, you just mentioned traveling a lot. You've talked about travel a lot. Where, where have you not been that you want to go? What, what is still on I your act, I've never been to Egypt. I'm really not much in the mood for travel at the moment, but um, I used to go to Louisiana every month for a week to spend time at my home. I haven't been to Egypt. I have not been to Brazil. Um, I've been to a lot of other great places from the Philippines to India to Japan to Norway. And, and how, how long do you stay Mexico. in these places? Because I mean, you know, well, to get... Depends. Six weeks was my first trip to India, where I had a show. I got there and they hadn't even broken ground on the gallery yet. <laughs> wow! And then I went, 
went to an ashram for a long time. Um, and it was a great experience to be able to be away that time. It's just hard to come back. I'm too involved now to spend great lengths of time away, even with the phone. I've been going to Eastern Europe. I've been to, I've chosen Moscow, St. Petersburg, Siberia, uh, Kiev, Odessa, Kazakhstan. I've gone to all those places for about a week. All the popular hotspots. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, St. Petersburg is the greatest thing on earth. Yes, like, it is. Only I, went to, I went to St. Petersburg when it was Leningrad. I, that's a while ago. Well, yes. I got to go to, I'm sure you did too, the Yusupov Palace. You know, did you ever read the book Lost Splendor by Prince Yusupov? I, I, I know uh, of it. I have not read it, but I had, but I and, I, and I did go. I went pre perestroika to Russia, where one of my good friends, whose father was the British ambassador, um, and I, you know, we went and visited all over um, Russia at the time. But you know, you have there's a lot of different things with you. There's so much. There's so much with you because you've been an artist for so long. You've been so prolific, and and I, I look, I, you know, researching you is is a sort of a luxury almost because I kind of myself and I, I even dreamed about your pictures last night hunt your your pictures came up in my dreams uh, which is rarely happens when i've got a guest coming up but i was somehow cavorting with one of your rabbits who was a larger than life um it sort of became a, a, a huge gigantic rabbit was in my garden it was one of your rabbits though it wasn't just a rabbit it was a hunt Sloan rabbit um now this whole rabbit concept I, you know, when I first saw them, I was like, it's a little different from some of your other work, even the, the birds you have behind you, there's more detail, but with the rabbits, it's more, it's almost a little bit more pop artish, in my opinion, I'm not an expert, but when I sort of look at it, it's a little bit, the ears are simpler and what have you. What's, what is the deal with the rabbits for you? What, where does the rabbits come from? I, I, I hear that you're the sign of the rabbit. I found that out late one night with them too much alcohol and needed food. And I looked at the menu and it gave the dates of the different signs. That was the first time I found out I actually was the sign of the rabbit. Um, I don't think I'd really started painting rabbits to this degree at that point, but I was painting saints early on. And I always put a group of rabbits at the foot of a saint for some reason. I don't know why. I just had a beautiful image of them that I wanted to use and I used it over and over again. And then I started taking things out of those paintings and leaving the figure out. And um, that's where it began. And I just started painting wet to wet. Uh, trips to in the um, grid pattern. I lived with a 35 foot aviary in my studio. And I came back and looked and I was looking at everything through the grid. Um, an early review I got said if Cornell had painted, it would have looked like what I do. And I forgot that Cornell put all these birds in boxes with chicken wire and grid pattern and whatnot. So that was a pretty interesting comparison. But I've lived with all these creatures for my whole life. And I've had an enormous experience at bird keeping. Um, I'm dwindling in that at this moment. You know, it's not. There's wonderful sanctuaries that are around. And um, I've had enough experience to do it blindfolded at this point from my observation. I had 18 toucans at one point. I've just been through everything imaginable and you can't do that anymore. It was I was born in a moment where it was much more open and possible. Um, the rabbit just has a mind of its own. I work with a lot of healers and mystics and channelers and the rabbit has a big voice and said it's a community I guess that they would take me places that I'd never gone before it wasn't that I did it because of that I was already immersed in the thing my rabbit book the bunny book is entitled Quantum Leap by Bruce Elander he's an old friend in Florida and it just um, somehow it has a big hold on the human psyche. I don't know why. I'm also doing huge 
mosaic of rabbit outdoor sculpture. So maybe you're getting a colossal mosaic. Exactly. That's just something that something, comes something recently. Was but also, like, even if you know, you, you you've talked about Alice in Wonderland as well in your in, in previous quotes and things you've said in the past, and you know, there's no doubt that there's something about the rabbit which is incredibly curious for everybody. It, it's both a pet, but it's also comical. It's also mystical. It's there's a lot of sort of things about a rabbit which, for some odd reason, of all, I mean, because you don't see that with squirrels, you know, you don't see that with. Sort of fox. You don't think about squirrels as much. No, rabbits have huge. What is it about rabbits? What, what, what is they it have about some rabbits? mystical? I can't say, but they've brought you know great um, mystical and um, you know the Mad Hatter. It's a you know, Alice in Wonderland is just full of it. And there's Harvey the Puka. There's Bugs Bunny. This goes on and on and on. Um, and they've been painted for centuries. I mean, the rabbit has always been present in art. I mean, the famous Durer drawing of the rabbit is probably the best known early rabbit um, imagery I can think of. They just have another level of dimension of consciousness and a group message, apparently. When I was a kid, I saw people were tested to see if they were pregnant and in the 50s when I was born and a child. I was born in 51, contrary to what some other people have written. But anyway, um, if the rabbit died, the woman was pregnant. So every human that's alive in the 50s killed a rabbit. <laughs> and then they, everybody carried rabbit feet as lucky charms. I like that term a lot. Rabbits are associated with um sexual prowess and luck so they've been pretty heavily um considered in both of those areas for a long time we now we're trying to we protect have in fact them. talked about the vibrator there's a there is a vibrator called the rabbit which is completely i'm unaware of that but thank you for sharing it all there you go now you know quote we, had a, we had a now sex i know quote. We had a sex doctor on Shaken and Stirred who talked about the rabbit, which is a vibrator. You know, you're absolutely right. You said sexual prowess and the rabbit. And hey, there you know. Now you know, Sloan. And luck. 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 I mean, I've been titled so many of my works Lucky Charm from my youth. And that was considered a source of luck. Now people are chopping up alligators in the South. and having them everywhere, gas stations, there's, anyway. Um, well, so the rabbit has been- Talk to us a bit about your, like your, your interest in the South. I mean, this, the, you, I know you went, to, you went to college in Louisiana, you went, or, or, or at least at Tulane, you went out, but you have a, a lot of interest in the, in, in the South. What is it about the South that, that stimulates you? Why are you so fascinated? And I'm, by the way, you're talking to a fellow uh, individual who loves the South, so does Tom. We we both love the Bayou, the South, Alabama. My wife is from Alabama, so I spent a lot of time there myself. Okay. What is it with you? Well, all three of my houses are on the bayous. I'm on the Bayou Tesh, La Pouge, and Old River. I'm in Point Capi Parish, um, St. Mary's Parish, and um, La Pouge is an Assumption Parish. Um, I love the agricultural society. You know, I think that's why I like Central America so much. There's something so sublime about sugarcane being grown all around me and the harvesting aspects of it and the yearly ritual of these fields being planted and harvested and trucks clogging the roads. And it's just a wonderful recollection of times before now it's all done by machine and whatnot or primarily and um it just slows things down a bit when it's about this annual cycle rather than an internet exchange of three seconds um my live oak trees are magical they're sometimes called king trees because they can actually affect 
the future of those who gazed at them, covered with Spanish moss. Um, there's a primordial energy in some of these areas that I'm in that I, I don't sleep better anywhere in the world than in Point Coupee Parish and Bachelor at Lakeside. Amazing. I, I didn't, my grandmother was, her family was from Chattanooga and that kind of got a grip on the back of my neck because we moved so much and I didn't really know what was home. And um, she was the only daughter of nine children. Um, so we would go there every year and catch fireflies and have all these great fun experiences. And I just thought it was terrific. And it seemed like I had roots in some of this. So um, I'd always wanted to go to Louisiana when I finally went there. I've never stopped going. And it's affected my work a great deal. Um, in terms of the nature, we have all kinds of exotic things that were on what we did had a black panther near one of the houses. Um, but isn't it funny, isn't it funny, Hunt, about the South? Because, you know, I'm an Englishman, right? So I'm someone who only ever heard about the South from movies and books. And I grew up with this romantic idea and, and concept about what the South would be like. And, and, and to this day, like you, I am absolutely fascinated with the South and I am in love with the South. And in fact, I, you know, we go there, my wife and I have, we go down to, to, the, to, to Point Clear, Alabama. I'm not sure if you've ever been oh, down there. No, but it's very famous. That's so a very Point, fancy so We go down to Point Clear. So we have, we take a house down there every year and, and we have been staying there forever. Our next door neighbor is the guy who wrote Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. On the other side is the guys who did Krispy Kreme uh, donuts. There's all these incredible people living down there, right, there um, that you wouldn't expect, but it, but it, potentially. But the most amazing sunsets, and like you said, these incredible oak trees with Spanish moss hanging off them. It's mystical, and there's something so special that I, you know, my children have grown up going there every year, and they've just. You know, whenever they're down there, they become different children. They're, they're not the sort of New Yorkers that they were. They, no, they, you, you become more relaxed. Yeah, much more relaxed. I mean, I'm, people can hear it in my voice when I call them down there. It's amazing. Um, would I stay there forever? Probably not. But since the COVID thing, I've been down about six or seven times. I'm going down again in August. Um, but I'm doing, you know, saving these houses. We had to redo every support beam, roof, gutter. We had to reinforce. So let's talk about walls. this. Let's talk about these houses because we've talked about the art a lot, but you are, are literally a house restorer or a historic house restorer. We mentioned at the very top of the hour, you and I were talking, but I, I live in upstate New York near Kingston. I live in Woodstock, actually, to be precise. And but you have restored and, and you owned a house called Court's Mansion in Kingston for 22 plus years or something. What is your fascination with these old houses and and, and wanting to sort of restore them? What, what is that about? Well, Court's Mansion was my first and I um, bought it two months before 9-11 occurred. I had been taken to Hudson by friends, friends of mine from New York started leaving the city to go to Hudson and places like it. And I went to Hudson and I saw a second empire house with a tower. And I said, I don't see one here that I can do, but if one ever turned up, I would love to buy it. And I, we had dinner that night with two friends that had moved up there. And they said, well, we have this great realtor. And we all collect Gothic Revival. That's my one of my great passion um, furniture, Gothic Revival furniture. Anyway, I said, so what happened? You were buying a Gothic house. And he said, well, we decided to move to this place. But we had this great realtor. Anyway, I called him. And he sent me this picture of Court's Mansion, which is Second Empire with the tower and this magnificent, mystical setting. Um, they were brick manufacturers, you know, Hutton Court bricks. Um, I just fell in love with the house and 
somehow it worked out. It had a lot of very rare things about it. It had mantles that were cast iron mantle covers, which no one has ever seen another pair in the history of the world. I mean, it's been in my books and antique dealers have commented, you know, there's just a lot of terrific special things about the house. Um, I kind of outgrew it, even though it's quite large, but it really had a very, very mystical energy. And I um, stayed there for 22 years. And I recently, my last three purchases are Thurl's Castle, Maidwood in Napoleonville, Louisiana. And before that, where we go most often is Del Terre in um, Delaware County, New York, in South Portright. It was built by a Mr. McLean, who's a copper baron, and it's a huge, huge kind of Georgian looking house that he built for fox hunting. And we had to, you know, I just like saving these places. A lot of them were used as institutions of some sort prior to my coming there, but are intact enough that it's just a matter of taking out a few things that were added, but all the original stuff is there. I never alter um, anything about the house in its original form. I only bring it back to where it was. Are so, they then open to the public? How does it, how, how are they shared with, with people? Privately, I Maidwood was open to the public and we were not a success at that and was really getting in the way of the restoration. I mean, we'd be like, a year without a floor in the double parlor to rebuild the support beams and you know somebody would you know it's just too hard and it's not lucrative and i try to collect you know good furniture and when i saw a belter sofa with a leg broken off after some gathering i went that's you know because <laughs> i'm really trying to save the house and put it back into um an elegant state that it had been. And there's stories written about many of these houses that are 150 years old. I mean, there's a whole thing about visiting some of these houses in Louisiana and Maidwood as well, well um, represented and color schemes are spoken of and the parties and it's really quite spectacular. We have a huge ballroom. How do, you have, how do you have time to go to all these different houses? How do you have time to spend time in all of them? Well, they're not all houses. I have an armory in Scranton, Pennsylvania as well. It's like the Park Avenue Armory. And I, I did a book called um, Pleasure Palaces. No, no, no. It's called Gatekeeper, World of Folly by Asseline. And it, I've done all the rooms. I mean, you have five American presidents spoke in this place. Brock Mononoff played there. That's the other thing that's so fascinating about doing this. And the idea of time travel is a big one in my book. Um, you, you know, and I have ghostbusters that come in. You know, we have all kinds what of- What do you mean by time travel? What are you talking about? I'm talking about bringing it back to where it began or turning it into a place where period rooms and furniture and colors kind of catapult you into feeling that you're not in this time anymore. And um, you just have that experience. I mean, I'm not making this up. Other people, oops. Okay. Sense it as well. Um, and we have all kinds of funny experiences. Somebody brought a load of furniture one week and they were videoing it and this orb appeared and went into the main part of the armory and had a little happy I wanted to actually photograph and I asked my person who was cleared the energies I said what was that I said oh it was an extraterrestrial being in their armory um but we've seen ghosts a million times and um it may have even been part of the underground railroad they're 20 miles of tunnels under this place. It's amazing. Um, I have a painting. Have you ever painted ghosts? Is that something that's interested you to paint doesn't ghosts? Doesn't really interest me. That's not, I'm not particularly, 
I have early on when I was in school and whatnot, it was a much more interest to me. I'm more interested in pure spirit and, you know, rising above stuck energies, but they're certainly, they speak and there's a lot of interaction that happens because of the histories of these houses and the, so many presidents have visited them and um, McKinley had dinner at the Ford's mansion. Eleanor Roosevelt used to entertain regularly at Beltaire. They had women's conferences there. Um, women from all over the world came there. This is McLean. So there's just this wealth of history that accompanies all this. And somehow I had the Woolworths house. that had been abandoned for 18 years in Scranton. And, and um, we couldn't make any progress on the restoration. But anyway, it turned, but she looked in, because she came there and went into town for four days, that everything in this house is gridded to Mr. Woolworth, and nobody can touch it unless they change the grid, and she did, and then it began. But for five years, I was running into obstacle after obstacle. Anyway. Amazing. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I mean, look, your stories are just so epic, because they, they do span the test of time, and, you know, you have an extraordinary... I guess this grasp of what what's been going on in, from pop culture to historical culture to 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 the, what's happening in the future. You know, you, it's really amazing to hear you talk about what what you've done, what you were doing, and 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 what is to be done. You know, you have a new book out, Hunt Sloan and the Bigger Picture. You have um, the, the, apparently the Scala's annual catalog cover is is the cover of your book which is apparently like winning an oscar so congratulations on that um thank you no of course well done it, it, you know you on, on which means in, in itself is extraordinary because it's just, you're not like some new artist you're still at the top of your game you know at, at age 70 which i know you don't want me to mention your age because you at the beginning of the show you were like do we have to say that but it's like it's incredibly impressive that at age 70, you're still, you know, you're, you're right up there. You're, you're producing art that is absolutely relevant. You mentioned the Kardashians, your clientele is, you know, as cool and as hip as they could be. Everyone is still fascinated with what you're doing. I mean, it's just amazing. I, you know, your new book is out September, 2021. So um, look out for it, Hunt Sloan and the Bigger Picture. Um, and, um, you know, we, before we let you go, we'd love to wrap up with something we have, which is called Last Orders uh, on Shaken and Stirred, which is a real simple uh, sort of, uh, you know, quick action um, questionnaire. Are you ready? I hope so. <laughs> Here we go. Simply said, hot or cold? What, which what? do you prefer, hot or cold? Cold. Why? You know, it used to be the opposite. I guess with the age advancement, I do better in the cold. I, I don't do as well in the heat as I used to. I well, function in both. I function in both, but I prefer the cold suddenly. M mountains or ocean? I actually like flat land. That's why I like Louisiana. I'd probably say mountains at this point because I'm in more mountains than ocean. Yeah, look at that. I, I would have thought you would have said oceans for sure. Okay, Hunt, in, in the movie of your life, who would you have play you? I really have not considered that option <laughs> at this point. I can't say. Hunt, what gets your goat and what floats your boat? What floats my boat is great synchronicity when things just float and roll with some kind of other plan that's positive and wonderful and no big collisions of personality or impatience of what, what gets my goat. Um, people asking me too many questions. You ask questions in a very good way, but some, you know, I say to people a lot, you know, this, I'm not having an interview now. I'm not giving interviews today. People want to ask a million questions a lot, and it just 
I'm just spent. I can't do it anymore, you know? So it doesn't happen all the time. No, so. I understand. Well, we, I have one more question for you on that note. You're no, fine. No, you're fine. I'm knowing no, that no, your, what gets your goat is being asked questions. Hunt, I have Too one. Too many questions. Here we go. Simple what? question. Shaken or stirred? I probably put shaken because I'm often taken to a new thought process through being shaken where I come to some startling realization by a jarring moment or a, a, an uncomfortable exchange. And then it makes me think. And sometimes the reflection really takes me to a whole new place. There you have it, people. Hunt Slonem, Shaken. The bigger picture, his new <laughs> book, his 15th stunning book, out in September 2021 by Ted Vasilev, who was also on Shaken and Stirred. Thank you so much for really just talking to us and opening up. And I appreciate it. Listen, I understand. And, you know, you must have done thousands, if not more, interviews oh, in your time. Uh, it's, we really appreciate it. It was really fascinating. Now, this we was a pleasure. Time. You were great. It was wonderful. Well, cheers. Thank you. Good luck. Cheers. Here's to the next 70, Hunt. Okay, come see us upstate. <laughs> Will do. All the best. I want to make another 70. That's my goal. There you go. I believe you have it in you. Thank you. <laughs> All the best. Good to meet with you. Thank you very much for listening. That is Shaken and Stirred. We will be back next week with another podcast and another fantastic guest. And uh, stay safe. See ya.